Hey y'all, I'm Andrew and this is The Snake's Paw. Today we have a basic pitch for you, but before we get started on it, we were doing a couple of experiments with this episode. One of them was an experiment in video and it went badly. We do not have video to share with you this time around. We'll try again soon, but for this episode, we're just doing our regular audio and it's slightly lower quality audio than we usually have. So thanks for your patience. Sorry to say you'll hear a little less of us laughing at our own jokes in this episode. But the other experiment was with the format of the basic pitch. And I think that one went pretty well. See what you think. Here we go. Hey y'all, welcome to The Snake's Paw. Today we are doing a basic pitch. If you have not tuned in for basic pitches before, this is where somebody proposes an idea, a usually half or maybe quarter baked idea, and we brainstorm it out together. Uh, we were in three different places, so we're doing this over the internet. I'm in Spain for some reason. So the miracle is that we're all awake at the same time. That's right. <laughs> so. This basic pitch is going to be a little bit different uh, because usually one of us will have, as you said, the quarter baked idea and the rest of us will try to mold that into something usable or at least mold it into something hilarious. This time around, I had the idea that maybe we could all start with a trope and then all three of us could kind of do our own riff on that single trope. And then maybe at the end of this, we can all take our three different ideas and see if there's some way that we could blur them all together. Okay, <laughs> cool. I did not realize we were going to try for... Uh, that last part, for... Yeah. I mean, we don't have to. I just figured, uh, we'll, we'll see. Good Less word. than 24 hours ago, I gave you guys the, the trope concept, right? And mm -hmm. it yes. was one of my favorite tropes popularized by the Airbud film franchise. And that is the, there ain't nothing in the rule book that says a blank can't play blank. And if it's okay with you, gentlemen, I'd like to go first. Please, absolutely. So uh, I think the spirit of the story isn't about it being dogs so much as people exploiting the rules to a game to their advantage. So I don't know how familiar the two of you are with the uh, World Championship of Beer Pong. I know what Beer Pong is. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just, those of you at home who don't know what Beer Pong is, it is a, a team sport. Wait, 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 wait. Is it a team sport? <laughs> it is, absolutely. Usually teams of two. You learn something new every day. So uh, there's a lot of different rules to beer pong. So we're just going to go with the, the standard ones, the World League of Beer Pong official rules. Each tournament is two teams of two on opposite sides of a ping pong table. You get the triangle of cups. You have to take turns throwing ping pong balls and sinking them into the opposite team's cups and if they land a ping pong ball in your cup your team has to drink that cup and the cup is full of beer i think that covers everything right that that's the rules and your elbow can't go over the line of the table that's right that's a big one watch that oh. so the important rule is that your team has to drink it doesn't say who on your team has to drink so sometimes you'll have the one guy who's the designated drinker so I pictured the rags to riches story about a person who really wants to make it big in the beer pong league, like his, his father and his father before him, but he's just not very good at throwing the ping pong ball, but he can drink. And one day he meets a kid, like a 10 year old kid, who's just a prodigy at throwing the ping pong ball, but obviously he can't drink. So they team up and they rise through the ranks, just creaming the competition. And everyone's going to be like, you can't have a 10-year-old in the World Leagues of Beer Pong. It's like, well, there ain't nothing in the rule book that says a 10-year-old can't play beer pong. When you started this, I was confident that it was going to be a dog playing beer pong. And I was going to bring up age-related concerns because most dogs are <laughs> under 21 for their entire lives. But you, uh, you did the same thing in a different way. I'm proud of you. That's right. And <laughs> either way, the dog would not be drinking. Correct. But the dog would, of course, be throwing with its <laughs> fingers <laughs> those fingers that a dog has so that is my basic concept i will say that in the traditional sports hero movie there's usually a time in the the final battle uh the final match the final football game where one of the main characters who's been carrying the team suddenly can't do it anymore and the rest of the team has to like step up i don't know what that would look like in this particular instance because it would either be 
the guy who's just really good at drinking really fast has to suddenly learn how to throw, which, yeah, that makes sense. Or the alternative to that is that the kid suddenly has to start drinking the beer. This movie is sponsored by Odules. Oh, you know what the perfect name for this would be? Air Budweiser. That's that the whole thing was leading up to that, wasn't it? Of that. Son of a... <laughs> I feel like too, the animals playing sports movies often also are like kid movies. Like it's kid sports, not professional sports. And kids are the heroes, and there's usually a like kids getting one over on the grown-ups. So the kid having to be the one who sort of rises to the occasion because the guy who just drinks all the beer has to be a little bit of a like lovable screw up uncle type character and it can be a little bit of agency on his part but i feel like the resolution is mainly in the hands of the kid who's gonna have to yeah be underestimated by the officious adults who run the Beer Pong World Championships, am I saying no, that I, right? I don't actually know if it's, that's what it's called. Uh, and maybe the Beer Pong Junior League is what we're dealing with here, just to, to <laughs> turn down the stakes on this kid a little bit. Yeah, I feel like the, the kid is going to need to be underestimated and pop out with greater resilience, whether for beer drinking or, you know, friendship than any of the adults it's really expected. Fun. It's really funny, the idea of this kid just suddenly being like, well, if I have to do it, I will. And he's just really good at drinking beer. <laughs> just knocking him back. I was in sort of a like goes sideways and like throws it past his face mode. And the judges are <laughs> like, yeah, that looks like drinking to me. So real quick, but a second ago when you said it generally deals with children's sports, my brain went uh -huh. to, well, what is an adult sport? Oh, probably like MMA fighting. And then it went to, I should have gone with a dog being the person fighting in an mma championship like air Bud. well i went down a tunnel and there are i mean to continue the aside just a little bit there are quite a lot of animals playing sports movies among them i think it's called ned is a movie about some kind of martial arts master who dies and he's trained both an apprentice who is the villain and a dog who is the hero and this dog that does martial arts is the protagonist alongside a, a you know, a scruffy human sidekick. I love how it's and so close to animal cruelty, but fortunately Ned is good at fighting, so it's not. <laughs> oh no, most of the cruelty is to the sidekick in the preview anyway. So it's one of those long trailers where the trailer amounts to the whole movie. I think it's called Ned. Maybe I'm totally misdirecting our listeners, but yeah, YouTube Ned, I'm sure you'll end up there. Eventually. Thank you for coming to my net talk. Following on uh, Andrew's thoughts about the kid building moral fiber through drinking beer or whatever. Uh, so, so in Airbud, there's sort of a subplot, a major subplot, where like the ownership of Airbud the dog. Is his name Airbud? <laughs> <laughs> whatever this, whatever the dog's name is. The ownership of the dog is disputed because he's like technically owned by this old, mean, I guess, kind of alcoholic guy. And the kid starts playing basketball with him for some reason. And I guess there's a sort of a custody dispute and it goes to court, which I, maybe that's how these things work. And the judge lets the dog just decide who it belongs to. So the dog obviously goes to the kid. And I'm thinking in this situation, maybe there's like a heartwarming, like, oh, the guy who runs the team, he's like an orphan and he's going to like adopt the kid. And they're like, you can't adopt this kid. You're bringing him to beer pong tournaments. You're not a responsible adult. And it just ends on a very sour note where they just have to be friends. Sour and mm. bitter. Sorry, yeah, beer jokes. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you're building a perfect B plot to this movie where, like, the main character, the drinker, has to constantly go and check him out of the orphanage, like, under different guises. Like, yes, I'm taking him to the zoo for Big Brother weekend or, or what have you. And they start to catch on. Like, you're not really going to the zoo. He's coming back smelling like tobacco and buffalo wings. Something's going on. <laughs> Yeah, the drunk guy himself is a litany of foster parents, so we get sort of a Mrs. Doubtfire subplot. Where he has to dress up as a different person every time. 
because this is all during what is no doubt a really intense schedule of the beer pong world championships you get some real like farcical action of you run to the orphanage in disguise you check out the orphan faking a different system of handwriting every single time and then you immediately run into the bathrooms at the beer pong venue whatever those look like and get out of the disguise so you'll be recognized as the job that you're supposed to do and then you're putting on the disguise again to go drop them off there's lots of quick changes only you have to watch like we watch in mrs doubtfire so i think that'll be probably the pinnacle laugh sequence if we need a little bit of seriousness to cancel out all of the the bodysuit changing shenanigans later usually in a sports movie like this there's the unsanctioned game that they they use to warm themselves up where they meet the antagonist team or something goes horribly wrong so i could just see like one of the kids first games is he takes them to a, a back alley street beer pong game where the ping pong balls are flying left and right and he has to dive in the way of a ping pong ball to save the kid and he's just like i don't know man maybe this is too dangerous for you street rules beer pong street rules no holds barred beer pong your elbow can go across the table if you wanna we don't care you throw like spiky little like caltrops into the beer instead of throwing a ball and you have to like you have to chug it and try not to swallow the spiky thing and the cups are actually just full of bleach (laughs) welcome to bleach pong (laughs) all right do we want to proceed to trope if we're gonna have to lace other stories into this plot i think we need to leave that one a little bit loose around the edges good luck following that one guys (laughs) i can go next okay so i decided because i'm living in spain i thought i should do something that is you know has some local significance there's lots of animals doing human sports there maybe should be more humans doing animal sports. Oh, no. And so, like, what if there's no rule that the bull in a bullfight has to be a bull? And so there's this person whose lifelong dream, because there's, you know, the history of movies. There have been all these, like, bullfighting movies. And it's always about the matador. It's kind of the rise and fall. It's very similar to, like, music biopics where they reach incredible fame and then they get into like a frivolous lifestyle and things kind of fall apart and of course they always die at the end because they're bullfighting do they all die from getting gored by a bull generally not always but that's usually the case what's the i'm sorry to, to dwell on this i really just i'm very curious what is the cinematography of the like gored by a bull moment typically yes i would say based on what i can remember like a lot of these films will mix like staged shot fiction footage with actual bullfighting footage. And so what they'll do is they will actually get like a shot from a bullfight where someone actually gets hit by the bull. Oh, it's not wow. always clear whether it, it's not usually like a close up because it's documentary footage. It's usually from mm-hmm. a, somewhat of a distance. And so this person will get hit by the bull and then they'll copy the costumes for the fiction part and like just incorporate that footage into it to make it look seamless. Got it. So I think generally that's at least once they were able to do that in like the 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, that's so fascinating. That's really at least as, I mean, obviously less niche of a genre from the Spanish perspective than <laughs> animal learns how to play a human sport, but pretty niche genre from from <laughs> over here in Louisiana where I'm sitting. Anyway, but always with these movies, it's very much about this he starts out as a kid or like a young man who like wants to be a bullfighter and he has to like go to some o- older bullfighter guy who like shows him the ropes and he kind of takes him under his wing and he starts bullfighting. And at first he's just doing like these little like provincial towns and eventually he becomes more famous. And then he becomes like the matador who's like most famous at that time. And of course his fire shines brightly and briefly and there's always like a woman who kind of leads him astray and so on. So we're just taking that structure and applying it to this guy who from the time he was a kid just really wanted to be a bull and just wanted to be in the bullfight and wanted to fight all the matadors. And so he's like hanging out with cows and he, there's like an older bull who kind of takes him under his wing 
unwittingly it's a bull it's just doing bull stuff and just learns the ropes you know imitates bulls and somehow like this is the part i'm not really clear on is how he try how he manages to convince people to let him actually be in the bull ring maybe at first it's kind of like a good I, joke i have a rodeo clown i have an thing. idea go, yeah run it, with it i mean it seems pretty obvious if he's been hanging out with the bulls and the cows are his friends and stuff and then one day they come and take one of his friends he's gonna have to go to the arena to rescue his friend and then when they open the the thing where the bull's supposed to be he's just there i just push the bull out the door and he's like oh hi and then gets interpreted as a clown and it's really popular and the crowd demands more i could totally see it and it becomes a comedy trope but he just keeps doing it and gradually gets to be more and more and more serious i could see that happening i can't uh ignore the similarities between this and gladiator Especially when uh, they expected the reenactment for Maximus to to die, but then he's just so good that he he wins and kills everyone. It's almost the same thing. We're like, oh well, we'll, we'll let the bull fight, and then the bull ends up winning, and then he stands up with his bull horns and is like, "Are you not entertained?" And that truly is the most ridiculous part of the whole premise: is that bullfighting hinges on the fact that the bull is a big, massive, scary animal that could hurt you just by like running into you. And this is just a dude. When they train you to bullfight, they'll actually have this thing where the guy who's like training you will have like bullhorns and they'll like hold them up to his head and like kind of go at you. So maybe like eventually gets those and becomes like a little more vaguely threatening. (laughs) I'm put in mind a little bit of here in New Orleans. So we have a riff on a Spanish tradition where in Pamplona, Spain, there's the running of the bulls where in kind of a rhyme with your typical uh, bullfight or uh, an inversion of your typical bullfight, every bunch of guys running from bulls through the streets. And in New Orleans, we do a running of the bulls, but all of the bulls, quote unquote, are roller derby girls. And a lot of them wear horns on their helmets and stuff, but they are actually kind of terrifying because they're on skates yeah. so they can move yeah, way faster than you can yeah and they have wiffle bats so they will like bash you usually on the butt usually not lightly by any means but like just hard enough to sting a little bit with their wiffle bats as they go by and it's not unintimidating watching them do their thing plus i mean roller derby girls tend to be pretty ferocious so mm-hmm. if he acquires Maybe not necessarily a wiffle bat, but some variation on like a weapon and actually gets to be pretty formidable and like unbeatable. Skates might treat it pretty nicely, actually. So th- there's there's an option for him becoming sort of genuinely scary over time. Also, something to bear in mind is that in a bullfight, the bull is killed at the end. Yeah, yeah. And parts Maybe. of him are eaten after the fact, if I remember oh, wow. correctly. I and so maybe part of the whole kind of premise here is that it becomes more serious and it kind of takes on a life of its own, like people humoring it, but it sort of metastasizes into its its own little thing. And the, the guy who's the bull keeps winning just because the matador, like he's, a, he, it's a dude, I can't kill him. That's murder. And so he becomes a champion and he's got this whole, like he's finally living his dream. He's like the most famous bull in Spain. And then it either ends with him dying or <laughs> being actually stabbed by one of the matadors or just being a famous. There's player. a very obvious joke there about um, him once he realizes that uh, the matadors might try to kill and eat him, that suddenly there are great stakes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I, I do have to uh, ask, though, usually in a, a movie like this, I would expect there to be like a really great villain antagonist yeah. what would you envision as being like the big scary bad guy to overcome at the end is it one of the other matadors who just takes it too far or is it another bull that's like i'm supposed to be the greatest bull <laughs> or a combination of both for one of the matadors is like well if he gets to get in the ring and be the bull then i should be allowed to be the bull and then they're both just running at each other with the, the horns and he pulls out a football ball bat but the antagonist some younger human himself. bull comes up behind him yeah who does it better yeah maybe he starts like a trend of yeah. humans being the bulls and there's all this debate in just in general i suppose uh about the ethics of bullfighting nowadays um and whether it should be continued to be done 
And so maybe this is how they compromise the, or figure the out a PETA. <laughs> <laughs> I'm put in mind of a um, a, a critical response I once heard to, I think, a comparable work of literature to this, which is the Iliad, in which the the critic in question, I'm, I wish I could give credit where it's due, but I can't remember who it was, said that the protagonist in the Iliad, because you have people from either side of the same fight and like nobody's a hero and nobody's a villain. So where do you what do you call the focus of the attention? And she said the the protagonist of the Iliad is force and just its ability to turn people into things. And that like over and over and over again, protagonism sort of sits on one person and then they get thinged. They get like reduced and they vanish and force moves on to somebody else. And you're the bearer of it for a little while, and then you're the recipient of it. And the force itself is the main character. And in that way, I mean, bullfighting is so ridiculous. It's, I mean, viewed from outside in the same way that rodeo, which, you know, is very much a thing where all of us come from is ridiculous. But when you live around it, it's taken seriously. And both of them are these sort of variations on putting a human being completely needlessly up against some very powerful thing in nature, putting yourself up against force. And I kind of love the idea of possibly they're not being an antagonist in this. They're just being a whole bunch of people who like are laughing at this thing at first and then just gradually take it more and more and more and more seriously until our main character becomes more and more bull like and starts like hitting people with stuff as he goes by and they're like, oh, he put on skates. He's really fast now. And then he has like a wiffle bat, but then he has like a stick and he's gradually like a force to be reckoned with until one day one of the the bullfighters stabs him out of genuine like concern for himself. And there's like a national day of mourning for this lost bull man. No one intended to do it, but the plot just got away from all of us. I could see wow. that happening. I love oh how <laughs> earnest that got. Oh my God. <laughs> That's great. I also like the notion that he he like talks less and less as the film goes on. He becomes closer genuinely to being a bull. Yes. It, it makes me think too, of, I, there are parallels for this other than the Iliad. Um, <laughs> there's like Lars and the real girl. Do we remember that? Yeah. Which is a, a guy who just carries around a puppet and treats it like his girlfriend. And gradually this whole town that he lives in that are all like, do we humor him? Do we go along with it? But they all love this guy. And you gradually see how they come to live inside of his story. And he outgrows it because of that. And, and the puppet like dies at the end and he grieves and the whole town grieves with him, but he's able to move on and just be a regular guy. And because he was sort of supported through it, he's able to grow out of it. I love <laughs> like, I love the way your brain works because you automatically take this ridiculous story and make it so sincere and earnest. And meanwhile, <laughs> my brain is like, well, what if he gets bored and he goes over to rodeoing and he's just like got cowboys on his back and he's trying to buck them off. <laughs> Both equally valid. <laughs> the only question is which is the sequel to the other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was beautiful. Y'all. I love it. Okay. So briefly, do we want to see if there's the remotest chance no. of those <laughs> harmonizing as it stands? Or so, are we going to stand back and say no gonna way? We're going to need whatever yours is to be the glue to hold both of these. <laughs> the catalyst? So. Oh, dear. No um, <laughs> so one, having never seen Air Bud, and having now gotten to go in and like read about it, I'm probably never going to watch it, but like read about it. And the fact that there's like 18 sequels to it and like a producer has made his whole career on it. And meanwhile, like actors have been subbed out for the same characters over and over and over again. I really went down a tunnel with this to where not only I learned are there movies that do the kind of classic American sports movie plus our fixation on cute animals, there also are, and this is just a curiosity, movies that combine sports movie with the classic Japanese genre of kaiju, of like big monster animals. There is a movie called Crab Goalkeeper that is about exactly what it sounds like. And <laughs> 
I found the trailer and um, <laughs> I think the most interesting thing to report is that the crab costume is not the worst costume in the movie. The worst costume is the evil businessman because he wears a wig and it's way worse than the crab costume. Anyway, crab goalkeeper. <laughs> Uh, so there's that. So fascinating little corner of the world that you led us into with this. It made me think about a real life experience too. So many years ago, I used to organize and MC an event every year that was part of a new play festival. And the part that I ran was what we called an alternate ending slam. And it was this thing where anybody in town could bring a little five minute performance that was an alternate ending to a play that had been done in town that year or a movie that had come out or just a really well known piece of something or other. And I would like introduce all of them. And it was it was a really, really colorful event and people did some great stuff. But the thing that stands out the most is an event that sadly had an even smaller viewership than the Airbud sequels, which was a riff on the musical Cats. The guy who had organized the whole thing got up in front of the audience and it was just him talking for a little while. And he gave sort of this manifesto about Cats in a really self-serious way. The, the way that you can report on how successful something was in the kind of tone that says you very much disapprove of that success. It was yeah. that. It was like Cats has been around the world. It's been on Broadway all these years, et cetera, et cetera. And you really expect it to build up to like a condemnation of Katz's artistic merit. But what it actually came around to at the end of the manifesto was the injustice that in all the long existence of this play, never had a single cat been involved in any aspect of production. And that tonight at the alternate ending slam, we were going to write that wrong and do a production of Cats entirely starring Cats. And with that, they started playing a MIDI of some of the music from Cats. And I remember I was so engrossed by the speech that I almost expected a cat to somehow like yowl in tune with it. But what actually happened was this guy's colleagues all came out from backstage with cat carriers and open to them. And these cats came out and just freaked out. And they just, the music keeps playing. The cats run all over the place. They're hiding behind things. They're like looking at the audience. They're dashing out the door. It was total chaos. And I think it it not only left a mark on the imaginations of everyone present, I think it also- I for sure, I, I was there. <laughs> the Skin Horse, right? You were, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 Skin Horse Theater. I, so like nobody during that performance said out loud, ain't no rule that says a cat can't be in a production of cats, but you could have. And I imagine before the night was done, there probably was a rule that cats were no longer allowed on stage at that theater. <laughs> Cause there definitely was a conversation after the words that was like, that was fascinating. We're never doing that again. So basically what that leads me to is so reading about Air Bud and its sequels, I noticed in every sequel, Air Bud plays a different sport, which on its surface just shows how multi-talented Air Bud is. But under the surface, you could also infer that maybe after the camera cuts off on each of those movies, they actually made a rule that a dog cannot, in fact, play basketball, baseball, just volleyball. Sports every time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he just keeps moving on into something new. So and what I want to see... More and more obscure sports, like what dumb movie is it? The... A dodgeball, I think. There's like ESPN, the Ocho. It's like the most obscure ESPN channel that has dodgeball on it. That's right. Welcome to ESPN Five. I love the idea that like the all world. of these sports are coming up with this rule, but there's other sports who are like, surely they're not going to try it here, so we don't need the rule yet. And then suddenly he shows up to the fencing we tournament with a sword in his mouth, and like, well, I really want to see like an Air Bud pool hustler movie where like based on the hustler with paul newman where a dog plays the paul newman character <laughs> and it's like black and white and the dog's like lining up a shot and it's all like smoky and noiry. the dog's got a cigar and in his mouth this is the idea is that the movie that, that i want to propose it opens on let's say that but then as he's about to take the final shot then someone like whips out the rules and says like in fact 
there is a rule that says a dog can't play pool. And we would get like a sequence of those scenes where the animal is about to intercede and, you know, save the save the underdog team. <laughs> and each time we see like the villain come out and slap down the new rule that's been written, you know, the revised standard edition of the rule book that says, no, in fact, uh, a duck should can't ski or like, no, in fact, a, uh, a, a horse can't ride another horse at the rodeo or like, whatever it is. And we just keep seeing the underdog team lose and get booed off of the court. And we see the talented but disenfranchised animal walk away humiliated. And what it leads to is the courtroom drama that ensues when the animals sue to have those rules overturned. And either the movie is called Legal Eagle and the lawyer is a bird. Or we could roll with that stupid <laughs> meme about the guy who uh, did an early Zoom courtroom and couldn't get rid of the, the cat filter and yeah. have that guy say, uh, ain't no rule says a cat can't be a lawyer. Either way, we have an animal representing these disenfranchised animals and we watch them, you know, develop a community together around their uh, their shared interest, despite their greatly varying size and predator prey relationships. Well, this is the perfect glue to hold all these ideas together. We have like a sort of a legal coalition with all these animals who have gotten together to protest the anti-animal laws that don't allow them to play sports. And <laughs> then they've formed like a class action with an animal lawyer. That would be such a biased, like the eagle would have to recuse itself. <laughs> He's like, I am an animal doing a human job overseeing this court case about whether or not dogs can ski. I mean, humans are in court cases all the time about humans. So, and yeah, and then our child beer pong champion and our bull man can hop on this bandwagon, or they could be like you know, like moral support. Then we could combine characters. The the man who wants to be a bull, uh, he's also very good at drinking, but he can't throw the ping pong ball. Because he has hooves. He has hooves because he had hooves surgically attached to his hands in his effort to become more like a. Oh my god! Like and that's what he hits people with. Veering into body horror. It's like a, a tusk or some other Cronenberg style horror thing. <laughs> yeah, I totally see it. I think this animal coalition probably would want at least a token human, alleged human in the case of the the man bull, on their team solely as a way to say that what benefits one of us benefits all of us. It works amazingly well. I really did not expect that to, to happen, but I was just imagining this being the 27th sequel to Air Bud after they've run out of sports. <laughs> but in fact, it can bridge together anything. We can have all of, we can even have, oh my goodness. Okay, so all of the golden retrievers who got retired as actors in Air Bud itself, because they were uglifying with age, they could be there too. We're talking about like age discrimination. Oh, uh, we try not to bring up ages because that immediately destroys the entire premise of this trope. Where it's like, there ain't no rule that says a dog can't play basketball. Well, rule number one predators have to be at least 12 years old <laughs> in dog years. Ain't nothing in the rule book that says the years have to be in human years. I think the main result of all this is that the rule books are going to get a lot more complicated. I mean, I feel like anybody who ever went to school, we all had like class with that person for whom new rules were written. You know, oh, yeah, you like just thought James. you understood. Absolutely. James. Yes. Our friend James, who's featured in a couple basic pitches and is the and chief. Quite in a few other things. Yeah. Mars City Blues. He had a, and this is before like rolling backpacks were really a thing. He's in the early OOs, I guess. And so he had constructed out of like a mini dolly and a plastic bucket and bungee cords, a backpack that he'd roll around. But it was kind of cumbersome. And the hallways were crowded, so he was constantly like rolling over people's feet and bumping into things. And he carried this for multiple years and eventually ruled, made his way into the handbook that there were no like rolling packs of any kind allowed. I forgot about that. Well, yeah, I knew that guy and I forgot that I know that guy. Dear <laughs> blessed James. So I 100% buy that with the movement of animals and sports, people would try to Breeze progress. They'd try to turn back the clock, but as our lawyer character will show, ain't no rule that says you can make a rule that says 
dot 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 i lost the thread and i think we could have like a sort of a denouement if because i see this ultimately being like a success story we just get this montage at the end where these there are all these like sports so there's like basketball and baseball and there's bullfighting and it's just like every kind of animal imaginable is taking place in some way so like the matadors and ostrich and the and there's a basketball team that's comprised of like a grizzly bear and a mouse and just and the most they, absurd possible combination of every animal in person you could imagine the dachshund skiing on one ski that must exist there has to be a video somewhere on the internet of that that's true oh god someone's done that well i think we pretty much came to a conclusion yep. ain't no rules that says you have to have rules that's right what are some good titles that we could do with puns there's like yeah probable cause probable pause, pause. <laughs> strict cutiny edit right. that out I'm even. <laughs> <laughs> that's the show y'all let us know what you thought you can get in touch with us via youtube or instagram and you can also always find us on your podcast feed We'll be back again soon with another installment of Starship Mudskipper. We'll see you then.